Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Last Friday, we I introduced you. Uh, you were introduced to Rinosuke Aktagawa, our featured writer for uh, this piece entitled In a Grove. So just a little bit of a review. Rinosuke Aktagawa is considered to be the father of uh, Japanese short stories, 150 short stories in his entire career. And the theme of most of his stories is focused on psychological states, state of mind, and also the um, macabre themes. For those of you who have already uh, read In a Grove, you you kind of know what we mean by macabre. It doesn't have to be very gory or you know nakakadiri thing, but the fact that a crime has been committed and you know uh, until the very end nobody is punished for the crime not because nobody uh, everybody's denying of doing the crime but it's the other way around it's actually in a grove presents us uh, with three with the three major characters to be admitting the crime of murder of uh, the samurai so somehow that is a little bit confusing it's unconventional compared to some other short stories and novels that you might have read in the past. So, um, for this presentation, we'll be talking about In a Grove. So, this is the... These are all the characters based on the movie In a Grove by Akira Kurosawa. So, there are seven characters. And the one thing, one thing that you might have noticed in in a grove is that each character tells their own story so there's no one particular narrator in the story but that's what we call a polyvocal narrator meaning the the character's perspective is told by the character themselves so there's no one particular narrator in in a grove all of them all of the narrations are narrated in first person point of view okay so the first character that was introduced was the woodcutter and he was able to find some things. He was the one who actually found the dead body of the samurai and also some of the belongings, some of the things that was possessed by the dead samurai. Second character was the Buddhist priest. I'm sorry if my face keeps on you know, overlaying their faces. I'm so sorry. The Buddhist priest is the second to be questioned by the high-ranking police officer. And he was the one who saw the couple before the, sam before the crime was committed. And according to, the, according to him, the couple was heading towards Yamashina. The third one was the police officer. This is actually, this police officer could also be considered to be a, um, a bounty hunter. Some, some critics would say he's not really a police officer but a bounty hunter and he's the one who saw Tajumaru uh, who was thrown off by the horse that he was riding and it's as if he was very very tired and according to him Tajumaru uh, possessed all the missing uh, belongings of the dead samurai and therefore he actually concluded that it was Tajumaru who committed the crime of murdering and you know raping the the woman the wife fourth is the old woman this old woman is very important because she's the one who gives us she's the one who first gave us the name of the samurai and the wife because the wife is her daughter so masago according to her is fun loving and she has never known any other man in her entire life but her husband and the name of the husband was Takehiko and he was from uh, Wakasa now take note that according to the uh, woodcutter the dead samurai was was wearing a headdress of Kyoto style now it's not really conclusive but you know in ancient wherever uh, the way you dress represents where you came from. So, 
uh, just like in the Philippines, you know, you 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 know that they're Ifugao because of the way they of the way they dress. Do you know that they're Manovo because of the way they they dress? You know that they're Taosug, Muslim, and so on and so forth. So we're trying to say here that there's a little bit of inconsistency there because of the samurai. The dead samurai was wearing a headdress of Kyoto style. It might have sub it might have uh, suggested that he was from Kyoto. But according to the old woman, the uh, Masago's husband was from Wakasa. Okay, two uh, different towns or provinces in, in Japan. And they're not even close to each other. Okay, so uh, there's there's an inconsistency. Next up, we, ha we are introduced to the three major characters. So first, when we when we read the the story the the subheading or the heading that says Tajumaru's confession i bet most of you at the back of your mind at the back of your head uh was saying ah finally because you were thinking that the problem of the story was the crime itself you were assuming you immediately assumed that since it was a crime story, the problem was finding the murderer. But then again, when we read Tajumaru's confession, and immediately we had an idea, ah, okay, so this is now the, uh, the murderer. Finally, the conflict is solved. But how come there are two other characters left? Okay? Now, according to Tajumaru, he was the one who murdered the samurai after they had a sword fight. Uh, the very one thing that he wanted from the samurai was his wife. Uh, he was very attracted with a wife and according to him, he would do everything to get the wife. Um, he was not planning on killing the man. He was just after taking advantage of the wife. So what he did, he lured the samurai and then, you know, uh, after that, he went and told the wife that something's wrong with her husband, and so on and so forth. You've read the story. After that, these three characters somehow were consistent on the first part of their story. You know, because all four other characters told us what happened, what might have happened before the murder was committed. And these three characters told us what happened uh well tajumaru told us how it ha how the crime happened how the crime started and the, the the other two told us uh what happened how the crime was committed and what happened after well actually it was only tajumaru who told us how the crime was committed the woman and the samurai told us their stories, their version of the stories after uh, the raping of the wife happened. Okay? So, according to Tajumaru, after he took advantage of the wife, surprisingly, the wife clinged to him and told him to kill the husband or at least fight the, the samurai. Uh, because, according to her, he could, she could not be with two men, so one must die, and she will have to live with whoever stays alive. And because of that, Tajumaru was actually challenged, and he let go of the samurai, and they had a sword fight. But uh, unfortunately, or unfortunately, after he had uh, killed the samurai with, with a sword, and when he looked for the wife, she was gone. She ran away. And then here comes the wife who confessed at a temple. Everybody else was questioned by a police officer. Here's the wife who confessed at a temple. And, he, and she said that she was the one who actually murdered her husband. Because after she was raped by the bandit, she somehow passed out several times. And finally, when she was able to regain her strength, the bandit was already gone. And it was her and 
her husband who were left. And just by looking at her husband, she could see that the husband was telling her to kill him. And so she did with her small dagger, with her dagger. Remember, according to Tajumaru, she killed, uh, he killed the samurai with his sword. But here comes the wife who said, I killed my husband with my dagger. And after she killed the husband with a dagger, she tried to kill herself several times, but she could not succeed. It's as if heaven would even deny her of death. So that's her story. Now here comes uh, the samurai through a medium. So we're not talking about the character himself, but through, but through a medium. And according to him, after the bandit took advantage of his wife, imagine the, the hurt and the, the shame that he could have felt, you know, having your wife taken advantage of in front of you. After the bandit did that, he could not speak because he was gagged with, uh, with bamboo leaves. But he was trying to tell his wife not to listen to the bandit because the bandit was trying to, it's as if trying to convince the, the wife of something. Surprisingly, the bandit was about to go. Surprisingly, the wife told the bandit to kill him, to kill the husband. And he was surprised. And he even had forgiven the bandit because after the wife told the bandit to kill her husband, the bandit went to him, the samurai, and asked him what he wants him to do with the wife. You know, whether to kill her because she's such a disgrace, and then instead of, um, instead of caring for the husband, she actually told the bandit to kill him so he could uh, so that she could run away with with a uh, bandit but then the bandit let go of the samurai and then the woman ran away and when he was left alone his rope was uh, let he was let go of the off the rope and he found the dagger of the wife and he stabbed himself and when he was about to have his last breath, he heard the noise, but he could not really recognize who it was or what it was. And then somebody pulled out the dagger from his chest. And then he died. So, we're talking about consistencies and inconsistencies here. I tried to plot the consistencies and inconsistencies, and it's this chaotic here. First of all, we have the couple's destination. Where were they going? Was it to, to from Sekiyama to Yamashina? Or was it to Wakasa? Because if you check the old, the ancient map of Japan, these are two opposite directions. So where were they going? Second, the man's description, the woodcutter said that he was wearing a, a, the headdress of Kyoto style, which suggests uh, where he's from. But the old woman said, he's not from Kyoto, he's from Wakasa. Why would he be? It's as if like that. Uh, it's not in the story, but it's just like, if you critically think about it, why would he be wearing something that would suggest he's from, he's from Kyoto? Where, in fact, he's from uh, Wakasa. The woman's description, there is um, a consistency between this one. Where's my mouse? Here. Because according to the mother, to the woman, uh, the Masago, her daughter, was fun-loving. She was spirited, fun-loving, and she is uh, very finesse. But according to Tajumaru, he had never seen a woman of such temper. So there's inconsistency. Also, there's an incon inconsistency in the statement of the priest. Because he said that as a priest, he is not supposed to look at women. But he was able to say a great estimate of the woman's height, which was 4 feet 5 inches tall. So, and the woman was actually riding the, riding the horse. So, how could 
he gave an estimate of the woman who was sitting down aside from you know taking a very good look long good look at her so she, he is the buddhist priest actually uh contradicted contradicted himself and then there's the rope according to the three uh, characters according to tajumaru uh, he let loose of the rope because they had a sword fight according to the woman when he when she killed the husband the rope was still wrapped around the man but according to uh, the samurai it was also let loose there are also other inconsistencies between and among the characters and i'm sure you could actually list them down you know and you could see uh, how crazy this this story might might really be some of you might even be thinking that this is such a waste of time to read because uh you know it, it doesn't give us the conventional storyline it doesn't give us the conventional uh, conflict now, i want you to think about this why did the police commissioner and masago's mother believe that dajumaru killed Tahiki, takehiko or the samurai i'll tell you why the police commissioner who's also uh, uh, a bounty hunter wanted to establish that he was the one who caught this murderer because he will get something in return okay so he really wanted to establish that okay uh, I, I i've seen all of the sa of the of the dead samurai's belongings with tajumaru so he might be the one who killed him and tajumaru is very well known to have committed crimes involving women so it must really be tajumaru who killed the samurai and so when that's proven he gets something in return uh masago's mother believed because of course she would not tell admit that her daughter who is finesse who is um you know fun loving and um very feminine would be able to kill her own husband okay they have their own motive they have their own biases here second why did Tajumaru and the woman claim to have killed the samurai? And why did Takehiko, or why did the samurai also also did so? Probably because of pride. Or, I don't know, until now, we're still thinking, why? Because if you are involved in a crime, the the greater chance is for you to deny, even if you have done it the automatic thing for you to do is to deny it and not to admit but the three of them admitted and that's the problem that's the real problem now of the of the of the story the conflict now is not the crime but the conflict now is who is telling the truth the conflict has evolved because at the very beginning we were assuming that the, that the problem in the story is who killed the dead samurai but now because all three major characters admitted to have done it the problem now the conflict now is who's telling the truth who should we believe and where did the woman confess about killing her husband where was everyone else question i've already mentioned this the woman confessed in a temple where everybody else uh, most of the of the characters were questioned by a police commissioner or police officer I want you to think about these things. And where is Masago's small sword? That's the mystery of it all. If you have, if you have watched uh, In a Grove by uh, Akira Kurosawa, there is a suggestion of where a small sword is. Sort of a resolution. But in this short story, there's no, there's no resolution here. As far as the small sword or the dagger is concerned. Because remember, the woman and the samurai claimed that that was the murder weapon but it was nowhere to be found one possible possible explanation of this conflict is what we call self-preservation you want to always keep yourself away from harm you always have to save yourself first self-preservation somehow uh, makes us deliberately see things the way we want them to be and uh, that's the, that's the reason why 
that's the reason why the mother uh, kept on kept on defending her her daughter because she didn't want to uh, to have the society say something bad against her. Uh, all of these all of these characters were driven by self preservation. Probably the woodcutter was the one who got the got the small sword because he could actually sell that for for amount for an amount of money but he did not tell the police officer because uh, he didn't want to be involved he didn't want to be punished for for stealing a, a very important thing that has something to do with a crime that's been committed and that also goes for the police commissioner the buddhist priest and the the old woman and that also is uh, applicable to the three characters uh, self-preservation probably it's because of their pride uh, they wanted to admit that they were that they were the ones who killed the the samurai to establish that they still have their dignity. Well, probably for for Tajumaru, he had his pride of being able to kill a very w- well-trained samurai. The wife she admitted of killing her husband because of pride, not letting the husband suffer, the two of them suffer, but instead taking their own lives. It's just that according to her. Uh, she tried her very best to kill herself, but she, she did not succeed. And also that goes for the samurai, especially that he's a samurai. They have the harakiri thing. They would rather kill themselves than being killed by someone, uh, by their enemy. Okay. And of course, we're, we will be talking about uh, postmodern literature. Postmodern literature has a very different way of seeing things. For them, uh everything is distorted nothing is at the center of everything because uh it started from their very philosophy of god is dead and since god is the center of everything of life and he's dead and therefore everything is in chaos you know you could believe whatever you want to believe and uh there's an absence of plot or presence of cyclical plot as you can see each in each page there's a different character and there's a different narration you could actually shuffle these narrations and the story would still would still be the same there's no difference so there's like a cyclical plot and yeah um it's it's not a linear plot it's a it's cyclical you know it it ends where it began it it began with uh you know trying to identify who the murderer is and it it, it it ends just like that without without knowing who the murderer is there's a presence of metafiction meaning metafiction is a fiction within a fiction so all of these characters they are already in the story that's what we call a fo- foreground story and then they are telling us another story how they knew how they met the couple how they murdered, how he murdered the samurai, how he raped the the wife. That is another story that's like that's like the background story. So if there's a story within a story. That would also be present in in our drama, Six Characters in Search of an Author, when we when we go there. Okay. And postmodern literature is very well known for its mockery. It mocks, it makes fun of reality it makes fun of people and it makes fun of life in general reality because for them reality is relative okay it's not objective you could believe whatever you want to believe just like these things whatever you see here you could actually believe whatever you want to believe based on how you see things okay there's no lies if that's true for you, then it's true for you. If you think someone is beautiful, as long as you think that way, then that someone is beautiful. Okay. So relativity of truth. Truth is not absolute, but it's relative. It's subjective and not objective. So it's true with beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Right? That's what they always say. Nasa tumitingin yan. And truth is truth when you perceive it to be so. Nasa sa'yo din yan. Kung sa tingin mo, maganda ka, Eh, di maganda ka, yun ang pinaniniwalaan mo eh. Um, nobody could tell you that that is not true. That's that's how they, they see it. This is seen in the statement of Tajumaru. 
okay, this, this particular statement of Tajumaru. Because everybody thinks that he's the bad guy. Everybody thinks he's always the bad guy. But according to him, everybody does bad things. It's just that they have the power and he doesn't. And therefore, he's the one perceived to be bad. And all other, uh, all other people who are also doing bad things are seen to be the good guys. So postmodern truth and in the grove, you have their perception, their biases, etc. And that's how they perceive the truth. This is uh, an example of perception of truth. This is a local movie in, the 19, in 1989. You could see that, you know, there's a question there. He's, she's accused of, Masalome is accused of murder, self-defense, or is it adult, adultery, whichever, depending on the perception of the characters. The penultimate goal of a postmodern literature, and in a grove is a postmodern literature, is for it to mock life. It actually mocks the way we think. It mocks the way how, how we over-rationalize things. We all, people have the tendency to want to offer solution to each and every problem that we have, even though it's not our problem. Like for example, this crime is not our problem. We're just readers. But at the very beginning, we made it our problem to solve the crime, right? At the very beginning, you always you, you have already itched for the murderer. And when you could not find the murderer, you were frustrated. But whoever told you to solve the crime? It doesn't even involve you, so why would you so solve it? You see, it makes fun of how we think about problems. It, first of all, only the old woman gives us the names of our characters. Nobody, not even themselves, like the woman who confessed at the temple, she did not say that my name is Masago. The old woman gave us the name Takehiko. But the woman in the temple said that her husband's name was Takehiro and not Takehiko. And that's not a typographical error because in all copies of Inner Grove, that's, that's Takehiro. So what are we trying to say here? There, there might be a possibility that all of these characters might be talking about different crimes that happened in a grove. They might be involved in different crimes. They might not be talking about the same thing. That's why their, their statements do, are not consistent, do not match, because they were thinking, uh, they were talking about different crimes. And here you are, as readers, assumed very, very quickly that this talk about the same crime. And when you did that, and when the story did not give you the, the, the criminal, you got frustrated, and you hated the literature, and you hated, you know, Rinosuke Akutagawa. And therefore, postmodern literature succeeded. It mocks you, made fun of you. It's actually laughing at you right now. So that's postmodern uh, literature. I want you to think about that. I want you to I want you to digest that somehow and reflect. Okay? And with that, good luck and thank you.